This experiment sets the stage for some basic circuit analysis and implementation concepts. The circuit we'll build is a dusk to dawn light, a light that turns on when the room's light level gets low. For now, we'll just implement the circuit and introduce some basic concepts. We'll focus on the math used to design the circuit later. The fundamental goal of engineering is to transfer energy around to perform useful work. We may want to use a battery to light up a light bulb, a pump to move water uphill, or a turbine to create electricity from a dam. All of these processes involve converting energy from one form to another and transferring energy to perform some desired task. An engineer's job is to choose or design components and then interconnect the components in a way to efficiently perform the desired energy transfer. The example of this process we'll use in this project is a dusk to dawn light. The circuit will sense the light level in a room and turn on a lamp when the light level gets low. I'll start out by demonstrating operation of the circuit. Then we'll discuss how the circuit works and briefly describe the components used in the circuit. Finally, I'll show you how to implement the circuit using a solderless breadboard. This is the circuit we'll be building. This photoresistor senses the light level in the room and, in conjunction with this resistor, converts the light level to a voltage here. This transistor, a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, or MOSFET, acts kind of like a switch that uses the voltage level here to allow current to flow to this light emitting diode. When the light level is high, this voltage is low, and the MOSFET does not provide current to the LED. However, if I cover the photoresistor to simulate a low light level, the voltage here becomes high, the MOSFET provides current to the LED, and the LED lights up. Designing, analyzing, and building an electrical circuit usually begins with what's called a circuit schematic. A schematic is a stylized representation of an actual physical system. This is a schematic of our dusk to dawn circuit. A schematic is essentially a road map that describes the physical system. It shows the components and how they're interconnected and defines important variables and their sign conventions. A schematic is an indispensable first step in circuit analysis or design. An engineer always needs to do the mathematics necessary to show that a system they're designing will work before they actually build the system. Usually, variables and sign conventions are also defined on the circuit schematic as an aid to doing the mathematics. We aren't doing any of the math to model how this circuit works yet, so I'm not indicating any variables on this schematic. Before I talk more about the dusk to dawn circuit, I want to talk about those concepts in the context of a more familiar system, a recirculating pump system. This system has several components that are analogous to an electrical system, so looking at this may help us understand electrical circuits. The pump adds energy to the fluid. The energy is added in the form of a pressure difference. The pressure at the pump outlet is greater than the pressure at the pump inlet. This energy is not being created by the pump. An electrical pump, for example, converts electricity to create this pressure difference. From the standpoint of the fluid system, the pump looks like it's creating energy, but in reality, the pump is converting one type of energy into another. Fluid tends to flow from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, so the pressure difference created by the pump will cause the fluid to flow from the pump outlet around the circuit and back to the pump inlet. The valve in this system dissipates energy. It converts flow rate to a decrease in pressure. Notice that this system forms a closed loop. If I follow the loop, any pressure differences in the system cancel out and I end up with the same pressure I started with. Also, the flow rate into any component has to be balanced by the flow leaving that component. These conditions on pressure and flow rate govern the interactions between the components in the system. I can adjust the behavior of the system by changing the components. For example, Opening or closing the valve changes the flow rate in the system. Now let's take a look at these concepts in the context of a fountain. This is a pond in my backyard. I have a fountain stone here that I want to use to provide kind of a waterfall effect and a pleasing sound. So what I'm going to do is pump water into the back of this stone. It'll come out the top and recirculate and fall back in the water. To pump it through, I've got a pump here. 
from the standpoint of the water, the pump is adding energy. It increases the pressure from the inlet to the outlet. Now, as far as the water is concerned, that energy appears from nowhere, but the pump is actually converting electrical energy when I plug it in into pressure in the fluid. So the outlet pressure here will be higher than the inlet pressure. That'll cause water to flow through this pipe into the back of the fountain stone and out the top. It'll fall off here, go back into the pond and re-enter the pump. The water's forming a closed circuit and it has to get back to its original pressure level. It gets back to its original pressure level by pressure losses in the pipe and in the fountain stone itself. So let's plug this guy in. This is noisier than I want it to be. I don't want to have to yell at people that I'm talking to in my backyard, so let's see how we can change our system to redirect the water. What I need to do is take out more pressure. So I've added this valve to the system at the pump outlet to remove more pressure. This should limit the flow rate. What I'm doing is taking out some of the energy in the form of pressure here to balance things out and keep the flow rate down. Now, let's plug this guy in again. Now if I close this valve, That actually sounds about right. So now I'm putting in energy and I'm taking it out to give myself the flow rate that I actually want. That's very analogous to an electrical circuit. I add energy, I can use resistors to take out the energy and direct the flow of the current to where I want it to be and get the amount of current that I want. This is the schematic of our dusk to dawn light. A 9-volt battery is used to provide energy to the circuit. From the point of view of the electrical circuit, the battery can be thought of as creating energy. But it's really transforming energy from a chemical reaction into electricity. The sensor in this circuit is a photocell. A photocell is just a resistor whose resistance changes with light level. This is the symbol for a variable resistor. In terms of our fluid example, this is a valve that changes pressure. In this circuit, the photocell is changing its voltage difference based on the light level. The transistor, or FET, acts like a switch. When the voltage at this terminal is low, the switch is open and no current flows to the LED or light emitting diode. When the voltage here is high, the switch closes and current is allowed to flow to the LED. This element is called an LED, which stands for light emitting diode. The LED lights up when current flows through it and goes dark if no current flows. These two resistors are just to direct the flow of current to the other elements in a way that makes them function properly. Sort of like how we used valves in the pond to get the water flow where I wanted it. The circuit functions as follows. When the light level is high, the voltage across the photocell is low, and the FET doesn't provide any current to the LED, and the LED is dark. When the light level is low, the voltage across the photocell is high, and the FET allows current to flow to the LED, and the LED turns on. The light turns on when the room is dark. Circuit schematics allow us to understand and predict the circuit's behavior, but engineers need to build something after they've designed and analyzed it. This means that we need to convert the schematic we've been using for analysis to a physical circuit. We'll implement our circuit using what's called a solderless breadboard or a protoboard. Breadboards allow us to test and modify a circuit easily before going into large-scale fabrication of a commercial product. The first step in circuit construction is to identify the components that we need. Resistors are used to control current flow or to provide a desired voltage difference. This jagged line is the circuit symbol for a resistor. This is what the resistors we'll use in our circuit look like. They have two terminals, and it doesn't matter how the terminals are oriented. You can swap them in for end without affecting the resistor behavior. The resistors have a set of color-coded bands on them. These bands provide a code that gives the resistance value of the resistor. I'll talk more about how to read color codes later. For now, I'll just tell you what color bands to use. 
Photocells are resistors that vary resistance with light level. The symbol for a variable resistor is a resistor symbol with an arrow through it. This is what a typical photocell looks like. Again, the polarity doesn't matter, which means you can swap the terminals without affecting the behavior of the component. The transistor we'll use is called a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, or MOSFET. The device has three terminals, a drain, a source, and a gate. The arrow tells us which terminal is the source. The specific MOSFET we'll use is the ZVN2110. It has three wires corresponding to the drain, the gate, and the source. One side of the transistor is curved, as shown in this picture. The curvature allows us to identify which terminal is the drain and which is the source. The source is on the right-hand side if you're facing the curved surface of the FET. FETs behave like switches. In more official terms, they're called dependent sources. In our circuit, they act as a current source that depends on the gate voltage. If the gate voltage is high, current leaves the source. If the gate voltage is low, no current leaves the source. This is the circuit symbol for a light emitting diode, or LED. LEDs light up when you flow current through them, but the current has to be flowing in the correct direction, into the anode and out of the cathode. That means that LEDs are directional or polarized. So when building a circuit, you have to insert them correctly into the breadboard. So you need to be able to identify the anode and the cathode. This is a picture of a typical LED. The length of the LED wires identifies the anode and the cathode. The anode has a slightly longer wire than the cathode. The next step in converting a schematic to a physical circuit is to identify the circuit nodes on the schematic. Nodes are simply points on the schematic where two or more elements are interconnected. However, wires or perfect conductors don't really count as circuit elements since they don't introduce voltage differences into the circuit. In more official terms, a node has a single unique voltage. There are no voltage differences inside a node. Since perfect conductors don't introduce voltage differences, we can put them inside nodes. Identifying nodes is a fundamental step in being able to assemble a circuit from a schematic. We identify nodes in the schematic and then on the breadboard and connect the components in the schematic to the corresponding nodes on the breadboard. These are the nodes I've identified on the circuit. The letters I've assigned to the nodes are arbitrary. Node A connects this terminal of this resistor, this terminal of this resistor, and the positive terminal of the 9 volt source. B connects the gate of the MOSFET to this terminal of the resistor to this terminal of the photocell. E connects this terminal of this resistor to the drain of the MOSFET, and D connects the source of the MOSFET to the anode of the LED. Finally, node C connects the negative terminal of the voltage source, the cathode of the LED, and this terminal of the photocell. The next step is to identify where the circuit nodes will be on the breadboard. To do this, we need to understand how the holes in a breadboard are connected. A typical breadboard is a large white plastic component with rows of holes in it. Each row consists of five or six holes, which are electrically connected. Each row is electrically isolated from any other row of holes on the breadboard. Breadboards generally have one or more channels in them. The rows on either side of the channel are isolated from one another. Since there's no voltage difference between the holes in a single row, each row of holes in a breadboard can constitute a node in a circuit. This is a typical small breadboard. These five holes are electrically connected to one another, as are these five holes and these five holes. Any two rows are isolated from one another. This includes the rows of holes on either side of this central channel. So this row of holes is electrically isolated from the row of holes directly across the channel from it. The terminals of electrical components, for example this resistor, can be easily pushed into the breadboard holes. This allows us to use the breadboard to quickly interconnect circuit elements in order to create electrical circuits.
For example, if I want to connect a second resistor to this terminal of the first resistor, I simply insert a terminal of the second resistor into any hole in the same row as the terminal I want to connect it to. Now, these two terminals are connected. These two terminals are isolated from one another. If it's convenient, I can use jumper wires, just pieces of wire that have the right diameter to fit into a breadboard hole, to directly connect two rows of holes. For example, if I place a jumper wire between these two rows, both rows are now electrically connected, and they constitute a single circuit node. Many breadboards will have what are called bus strips running along the entire length of the breadboard. Each bus strip will generally have either a blue or a red line next to it. All of the holes in each bus strip are electrically connected. These strips can make it easy to connect the same voltage to multiple nodes. This is used mostly in larger circuits. Now let's use a breadboard to implement this circuit. To do this, we just need to assign rows of holes on the breadboard corresponding to nodes on the circuit. Then we insert terminals of our components into the appropriate holes. I'll arbitrarily assign my schematic nodes to these holes on the breadboard. I'm going to connect several components to nodes A and C, so I'm going to spread those out with jumper wires to give myself a little bit more real estate. The 10 kilo ohm resistor connects nodes A to B. The MOSFET drain connects to node E. The source connects to node D. And the gate connects to node B. The anode of the LED connects to node D. And the cathode connects to node C. The 47 ohm resistor here connects nodes A and E, and the photocell connects nodes B and C. Finally, the battery connects nodes A and C with the positive terminal of the battery connected to node A and the negative terminal to node C. Now let's wire this circuit up on our breadboard and watch it work. First, I'll use jumper wires to spread out nodes A and C. The 10 kilo ohm resistor connects node A to node B. Its color codes are brown, black, orange. The MOSFET has a curved side and a flat side. If I look at the curved side, from left to right, I have the drain, the gate, and the source. The drain connects to node E, the gate connects to node B, and the source is node D. This is my LED. The anode has the longer of the two wires. The anode goes in node D, and the cathode goes at node C. The 47 ohm resistor connects nodes A and E. Its color codes are yellow, violet, black. The photocell connects nodes B to C. And finally, the positive terminal of the battery, which will be this red wire, connects to node A. And the negative terminal, the black wire, connects to node C. Now if we cover the photocell, the LED should light up. As I said before, we'll revisit this circuit and do the math required for a rigorous design later. However, this project does provide a foundation for a number of concepts that will be introduced in the next few units.